Um, Sundays, uh, we have the Olympian Club pre-K through 6th grade, 9.15, 10.15 a.m. Uh, Monday, tomorrow, FBC conference and dinner at 6 p.m. And the speaker will be Paul Colbins. Uh, Galatians 5 is what he'll be speaking on, Living by the Leading of the Spirit. Uh, youth service will be available. Um, volunteer servers, please arrive around 5.30. Wednesday, we have a Bible study and prayer meeting at 7 p.m. at the Home of the Elders. And April 30th is the Women's Bible Study on the Armor of God, and that's at 7 p.m. here at the back of the church. June 17th to the 21st is BBS week, and that will be a Jungle Journey, uh, which is Anthem and Genesis. Uh, BBS prep days are coming up. Uh, please let Dawn and Terry know where you'd like to lend a hand. So, use some help with preparations ahead of time and with BBS and all that. So, please let them know uh, if there's some place you can help there. Um, Camp Tiglo, uh, primary and teen week starting July 7th. And the Fellowship of Bible Churches, or FBC Church. No, that's us. That's, that's us. us. Okay. <laughs> I get confused sometimes with the other FBC Fellowship yeah, of Bible Churches. That's a light addition to the. <laughs> Good. Okay, so as you probably have noticed, the last couple of years I've actually been printing out photos instead of just keeping them on my computer where nobody sees them. And uh, Dawn put some of them in a binder for us, um, and we also have a lot of older photos that have been floating around here, and I don't know why we haven't done this sooner, but um, why not make some photo archives of the many, many years of God's faithfulness to this church that we have on display? So if you have photo, printed photos, of anything Frizzleberg related that you would like to have in some kind of shared album or series of albums, and you want to bring those in and mark them, um, this is partly Don's idea, suggested maybe a ladies project and we can put those together and then they'd be available for us to enjoy. I know some of you have some pretty, pretty uh, vintage stuff, so. So yeah, bring your photos that you have in the church and make sure you, you mark what they are. One on the back of the table now. Okay. Yes. Yeah. One on the back table. So have a look at that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We have some uh, prayer requests. Um, we pray that you continue to pray 7 a.m. each day. Pray that the uh, Lord will provide a path for us. We pray that you continue to do that. Um, continue to pray for uh, George and Irene's granddaughter, Cecilia. Continue to pray for. Uh, things there with just some depression and that sort of thing that, uh, that she gets uh, treated for that. We continue to pray for Owen. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, go ahead, Jess. We have praise. Oh, good. We had our appointment, and it was successful, and he was a champ, and he conquered his fear, and I'm super proud of him. Yeah.
Secretary Paul uh, Colons. Uh, he finishes up his pastoral studies that will be coming soon. As he looks for how the Lord leads him um, as he moves forward. I uh, didn't have any other updates or any uh, updates or um, announcements that I missed. Uh, Wednesday night, we're going to uh, we're going to try to delve into the book of Ecclesiastes. So, how to deal with reality that sometimes makes us cynical and yet have God's perspective. Very good. So, Wednesday night, and Hank's book of Ecclesiastes. All right, any other announcements or prayers? All right, at this time, we'll have special music. Without 
without Jesus to lead and guide and love us. And that would be hell on earth. But we as Christians have Jesus, praise the Lord. He saved us, he's here with us every second of every day. But still as Christians we face hardships, don't we? Every day, every week of our lives we face hardships. And the fact is, everyone in this life faces hardships, whether you're saved or not saved. You lose loved ones. In addition to losing loved ones, many have had their faith shaken. Many struggle with depression, alcoholism, drug addiction. There's a rise of abuse in the home. Since 2020, the abuse within the home has more than doubled. Many struggle with anxiety concerning the future, the future of the country, the future of the world, the future of one's own health. Anxiety about what this world will look like for our children and their children once we're gone. This is a tough world to live in, and sadly, many churches have closed their doors for good since COVID. And the truth of the matter is, with all the issues that this country faces, keeping churches active is a major essential. I truly believe in my heart that the church is more than a building. The church is a group of followers of Jesus here for the purpose of encouraging each other and also reaching out to the world around us for Jesus. The building is not what reaches people's hearts. God working through his church is what reaches the hearts of man. God also works on his word, right, and the preaching of it. Because as Romans says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes through the word of God. These end times are scary. But it's not a time for God's children to bunker down. This is a time for God's children to rise up and share the blessing of faith and hope and love that we carry with us. This world is angry. This world is sad. This world is looking for someone to blame, and many blame our God. The way that Satan works best is to get us, Christians, to turn on each other. The fact is the problems that are in the world slip into the church. Because the church is composed of imperfect human beings who are saved by the blood of Christ. When we forget how blessed we are, the church starts to take on the look of the world. We start to take on sometimes the talk of the world. It starts in our hearts. We lose our thankfulness. And an unthankful heart then plays out in our words and in our actions. Our thankfulness to God is directly related to our relationship with God. In other words, if we're not thankful to God, then we will not love Him. But the more thankful we are to God, the more we love Him. A lack of thankfulness to God also results in a lack of faith in God. Being thankful to God for who He is and what he's done for us is absolutely essential in facing the, this life in this world. So today we're going to be reminded, today we're going to be remember why God is worthy of all praise and thanksgiving. And we're going to see those reasons in Psalm 100. So let's start today by reading this psalm together and then we'll see four truths from this psalm today. I'll read Psalm 100 with me. It says, a psalm of thanksgiving. Make a joyful shout to the Lord all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him, and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures for all generations. The first thing we see today when it comes to this psalm, point number one, that our attitudes matter. Our attitudes matter. This psalm starts by saying in verse 1, A psalm of thanksgiving. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lambs. Notice how it says, all you lambs. There, right? That means everyone who is a child of God should be praising God, no matter where you are, no matter what your circumstances are. This is for every Christian. If you're living in a car, if you're living in a three-story house, if you're in Africa, if you're in America, if you feel sad, if you feel angry, if you feel melancholy, if you feel happy, if you feel joyful, make a joyful shout to the Lord, no matter what your circumstances are or where you call on. Immediately, this psalm tells us that if you're a Christian, praise the Lord, period. 
I may not be a very good singer. No, I'm not. You may not be too, but I want to encourage you. This song encourages us this week to make a joyful noise to the Lord. It doesn't have to be pretty to everyone else. It's beautiful to God, right? When we sing to Him, when we praise Him, it's beautiful to God, even if we sound like a dying cat. <laughs> <clears throat> I like how other versions say, make a joyful noise here, right? Yep. It doesn't matter to God what our singing voice is. <laughs> it could be noise to everyone else. But we aren't singing to everyone else. We're singing to God. This week, get alone with God and shout to Him in a joyful noise of thankfulness. Now, my son Connor told me this morning, this isn't the first time he's heard this sermon, uh, but he told me that recently he was bouncing on the trampoline and he was thanking the Lord shout at people in the trampoline. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Now the original Hebrew doesn't say sing as loud as you can. It says make a joyful noise, meaning from the heart, right? Or shout, meaning shout from the heart to him in thankfulness. The emphasis here is not on our voices, it's on our hearts, our motives. We can sing loudly, but if our motives for singing aren't right, then we're just making a noise, right? The emphasis is to praise God from a thankful heart. One day all the lambs will be together in one assembly, standing in front of God together, singing as one, praising God. You know, I, I go to this thing called the Men's Prayer Dance. Um, it's hosted by a man named Harold Long, and there's about 600 men that go there. And everybody sings at the top of their lungs, and you can feel your bones shaking as that happens. Now that's 600 men. Imagine all of God's children from all time here, gathered together, singing to the Lord at once. Our earthly bodies can't contain that joy. It'll be one of the most beautiful things you've ever, ever been a part of. And the feelings in that time, I can't imagine. So why wait, right? Why wait to start praising? Sing now to God. Praise Him now. Next in Psalm 100 and verse 2, it says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Now what's this talking about? This verse is talking about not only worshiping God in service, but also how and why we worship God in service. This is again talking about our heart's attitude towards God. There's something else we need to notice in verse 2. Notice that worship with the heart and service go hand in hand. Look at verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness, then come before His presence with singing. Same sentence. Worship and service go hand in hand. They are inseparable in God's eyes. We cannot truly be one without the other. If we try to serve God with a heart that doesn't worship Him, then we're serving with the wrong motives, right? Remember 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Remember the way it starts. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a plain symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mystery and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. The love is talking about here is not only for our fellow man, but also for the Lord. In fact, love for our fellow man starts with love for the Lord, right? We go through the motion, but when it comes to service to God, our attitudes matter. It was uh, E.C. Olson who said, We cannot serve the Lord until we have given him the adoration of our heart. So we see here how important it is to have a heart that loves God before we can then go and serve him. Every single thing we do each day should be for God's glory, right? <coughs> but we shouldn't do it because we feel like we have to. We should do everything for his glory because we want to. We serve the Lord because He saved us by His grace and mercy, and we love to serve Him. If we serve Him for any other reason than this, then we'll be disappointed and we'll stop serving Him. This is the only reason. This is the only reason that lasts. This is the only reason that doesn't change, and this is the only reason that God accepts and blesses our service. We serve the Lord because He saved us by His grace and mercy. And 
we love to serve. The Bible makes it clear that we do not serve in order to be saved. Right? We serve God because we are saved. That's the proper attitude of things that should chew our hearts and our service. Attitude is very important. The rest of the psalm tells us why we're to have this attitude of service and worship to God. The next truth we see in this psalm, point number two, is that God is in control. God is in control. Let's read verse three together. It says, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. What's the first thing that verse 3 says? Know that the Lord is God. Do we know that the Lord is God? <laughs> Obviously we know that, right? If we're saved, we trust that He created everything, we sinned against Him, there's a penalty for those sins, and He loves us so much that He came here to die, paying the penalty for our sins, and gives us instead eternal life to believe and accept it. So we know that He is God. But what Psalm 100 verse 3 here is saying is, do we know that God is sovereign? Do we in our hearts know that God is in control? When we say it, do we know it to be true in our hearts? If we stop believing that God is in complete control, then we start to lose our attitude of faithfulness, don't we? If we start to doubt whether God really cares and whether he has everything under his control, everything going on from the global level to our own lives, if we doubt that he's in control, then we start to think that God is not as big as he says he is. And if we think that God is not as big as he says he is, then he becomes a liar in our minds. And we're never thankful to the liar. When we still know that the Lord is God, and we still believe that he is in control, we must know it in our hearts that he is. Verse 3 in the New Living Translation says, Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. He made us, we did not make ourselves. Sometimes when we're having health problems, we pray and ask God to heal us. And we have our human ideas of how He will do that, right? But we didn't make us. He made us, we are His. Sometimes when we pray, we try to figure out how God will answer our prayers. And we see all the possibilities of how He could answer our prayers, but oftentimes God does not answer our prayers the way that they are. He will. And when He doesn't answer our prayers in any of the ways we thought He would, we doubt God and lose hope in prayer. But then God answers those prayers the way that He wants to, and we look back and see Him working in it all along. And sometimes we're not going to get the answer as to why we allowed that to happen. We won't get those answers until we're in heaven. The key to staying anchored through all the storms and all the prayers is to trust that God will answer in His way, in His perfect time, and that His way is best. I've found, and the Bible tells us, that the key is a thankful heart that pulls God through it all. Now, I recently had this tested for me with this surgery that I mentioned. And I'm not going to go into details of how this was um, the worst night of my life so far. Um, but trust me that it was. And I was praying to God, asking Him to ease the pain. I was awake all night. I, had it. I was on oxycodone, muscle relaxers, trazodone for sleep, trying to make me fall asleep, z to make me fall asleep. I recoiled an antipodal, and the pain was so bad that I could not sit, I could not lay, I could not stand, and I could not sleep. And I stayed awake all night long. And I prayed to God for mercy the first few hours. I remember praying to Him for mercy to please ease this pain. And then I realized that wasn't going to happen. And so then I prayed to God for strength to make it through the night. And then my prayer shifted right around four o'clock in the morning, and I started praising God. And thank you for this. This was tested in my life two weeks ago. And in the morning, guess what? What happened was supposed to happen. And I got some relief. After. After I praised God for it. 
no matter what happens and how things look in the darkest days, a thankful heart will give us flames. And God blesses a thankful heart. All of the evil and death we see in the world is a result of our own sin. God is the same today as he was in the garden before man chose to sin. He still wants fellowship with his children. He still wants a relationship with his children. We broke that relationship. And like a perfectly loving father, he decided that he would mend. He decided that he would come and he would pay the price for us, even though we chose to hate him by choosing to sin against him. You know, it's not just Adam, we all sin. You know, we get tempted sometimes to be angry at Adam that he brought sin into the world. But guess what? I went to the next one. But God chose to save us from ourselves. Think about that. God chose to save us from ourselves. We chose sin. God came to right our wrong of choosing sin. He makes all things new. Not only that, He's going to fix all the wrong that we've done in this world. He's going to make a new and perfect world. Let's talk about the last book of the Bible. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more pain. No more sin nature. Through Adam, we all sin. And we all inherited that sin nature born into Adam, but through Jesus, right? The Bible calls Jesus the second Adam. Through Jesus, we are saved, we are born again, and our sin nature will not let last past this life. I'm really thankful for that. Now, I want to worship God without getting in my own way of that. And in eternity, we'll finally be able to worship God the way He deserves, without our sin nature getting in the way. So know that He is in control. He always has been. And know that He is loving and good. It's not up to us to have all the answers in this life. So why are things happen the way they do? It's up to us to know that God is in control, that He is love, and that He is good. Always. As our psalm says, remember and know that the Lord He is God. Not only will He make all things new, but the last part of verse 3 tells us that He is here now in this life we and guiding us, taking care of us. The last part of verse 3 says, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. You know, if you do a study on sheep and shepherds, you'll find that sheep often bite the very hand of the types of bees. Sheep bite shepherds. And often. Sheep are stubborn and sometimes run off from the shepherd and the flock. You know, I know my kids know this, and I know Alicia knows this, but what is the most dangerous threat to sheep in the wild? What, what the most sheep die from? Any guesses? A wolf. Somebody, what's that? A wolf. A wolf. That's a good one. Yes. Buddy. Running away from the shepherd? Running away from the shepherd? Essentially, yes. So what most sheep in the wild die from is actually falling off the cliff. They walk off the cliff and they die. Is it like they eat grass and they just walk off the cliff? Yeah, they just keep eating grass and walk right off the cliff and die. Yeah. Sheep kill themselves. They hurt themselves and they kill themselves. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the stupidest creatures on earth and we are sheep. <laughs> but sheep, like you said, buddy, run away from the shepherd. And when that happens, the shepherd leaves the flock and chases that sheep. And you know, when the shepherd notices a certain problem sheep, which is me, <laughs> but when he sees a certain problem sheep, what he does is actually breaks the legs of that sheep so that it can stop running away. Right? To that sheep, it seems like the shepherd leaves it. To us, we see the big picture. Nobody. We see the big picture. We see that it's an act of love from the shepherd. The shepherd breaks the leg of a sheep to keep it from hurting itself or worse. And you know the thing about God is that he will never stop going after us. And sometimes in life, we have things happen to us that seem bad. That seem like our shepherd doesn't love us. But in hindsight, we realize that through that hard time, he was loving us and growing us. In fact, he was protecting us. And he was bringing us back to the safety of himself. 
because we know that all things work together for our good and His glory. We know that He is in control. And that He made us, not ourselves, and that He is our loving shepherd. John tells us in the Gospel of John, or Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives His life for the sheep. He made us, He knows us, He is our good loving shepherd, and He is in control. When we know that, we find our heart's attitude is ready to thank and praise Him in service and worship, the way verse 1 through 2 says. The good news of God's love for us and His saving us from our own sins is the reason that we should do that. The reason we should do what we find next here in this song, which is thank, praise, and bless the Lord. Thank, praise, and bless the Lord. Read verse 4 here. It says, Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Now back in the days when this was written, the gates in this verse refer to the gates of Jerusalem. Uh, and the courts are referring to the temple where God met his people here on earth. Praise God we don't have to go to Jerusalem and go into the temple these days to meet with God. We can meet with him in prayer wherever we are and we have him dwelling in our hearts rather than the temple. Our bodies are now living temples. Do you not know, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You know, we often refer to the church as the house of God. And it is. Uh, but we sometimes forget that our bodies themselves are also the house of God. How do we, as temples of God, speak of God? Do we come before Him with thanksgiving? Do we praise Him? You know, we don't be, stop becoming His temple when our prayers end. We are walking, living, breathing temples of God. As verse 4 ends, do we bless His name? Bless here literally means speak well of, right? Do we speak well of God? You know, often when we don't say, speaks as loudly as what we do say. When we say this country is doomed or the world is out of control, we're not saying it, but we're implying that God's not in control. We're implying that God is not our good shepherd or implying that our attitudes are not grateful to God for what we do have. Mm -hmm. Complaining about things may not speak directly poorly about God, but it does reveal a heart that's not thankful. God dealt very seriously with the people of the Old Testament who murmured. Murmuring means complaining about things that we can't change. The words of our mouths are windows into our hearts. Psalm 19.14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That's the words of the man who remembers what God has done for him. And puts his trust and strength with thankfulness God. As temples of God, we thank and praise the Lord with our hearts and bless the Lord with our mouths by what we say and what we don't say. He is worthy of all thanksgiving. He is worthy of all praise and blessing from our mouths. In fact, that's the last one here today. Point number four. God is worthy of thankfulness. Verse 5 gives us just three reasons, right? That God is worthy of our thanks. Read verse 5 here. It says, For the Lord is good, number one, His mercy is everlasting, number two, and His truth endures to all generations. The word starts with, this verse starts with the word for, uh, which means this is why we should do what verse 4 says. Again, verse 4 says, Enter His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. And verse 5 tells us why. Because he is Lord. Verse 5 gives us, as I said, three reasons. And the first is because of everything good. Everything good. Verse 5 starts by saying, For the Lord is good. I want to encourage you this week to go online and to Google uh, the Lord is good scripture passage. You won't have any trouble finding it. That sounds uh, really good one at davidjeremiah.org. It's called 
23 verses about the goodness of God. But today I'm going to bring out one verse that covers everything. James 1.17. It says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down to the Father of life, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God is good. He's always been good. There is no variation of his goodness or even a possibility of his goodness changing. And because he's good, everything good comes from him. You say, well, I may not have much in this life, but at least I have my family. Thank God for that. He's the one who made you, not for yourself. And he gave you your family. He made them too. All we have in life is stripped away. Friends are gone, family's gone, house and money are gone, and our health is almost gone. We feel like we have no good thing left on this earth. We still have our salvation. And we still have our eternity of peace and of joy that we can't even comprehend that we're headed for. And that's something to be thankful for every day. Amen? Amen. Next in verse 5, it's because of this unfailing, everlasting love. I'm reading from the New King James here. It says, His mercy is everlasting. But I really like what the New Living Translation says here. It says, His unfailing love continues forever. God's love never fails us. And His love lasts forever. Humanly speaking, we can lose the love of others, can't we? Someone may love us their whole lives, but then their lives end. But as long as you are alive on this earth, there is never a day where you will have to go without the love of God. And His love is not some distant thing that you know exists, but you can't see it. God's love can be seen every day in our lives if we learn to recognize it. We are never alone and we are never without God's love. That makes Him worthy of our thanks. <coughs> If everyone you love and who loves you would die today, you would be alone in this world, you would still have the love of the one who created you. His love is unfailing and unending. His love for you doesn't stop when you leave this earth. We don't have to worry if when we die, God will stop loving us. His love is everlasting. Lastly, in Psalm 100, verse 5 ends with the third reason. Because of his enduring faithfulness. This whole psalm ends by saying his love endures from generation to generation. For a lot of us, the fear of what will become of our children when we're gone is on our minds and hearts. A lot's changed really quickly. Now I'm working at Frederick County Public Schools. There are some schools in Frederick County. I will put out a litter box for your child when we decide they're okay. I didn't imagine that 10 years ago. I didn't imagine that 20 years ago. What's the next 20, 30 years ago? I was walking into um, Safeway here in Westminster, and my grandmother was walking out with her son, who was probably about six, seven years old, and he said, I feel like I'm a girl, I want to be a girl. And his grandmother laughed at him. And that's the last bit of my heard. But she whacked up prudently. Like, okay, sweetheart, you want to be your own. But that's, that, that's the world we're in right now. What's the world going to look like 30 years from now for our grandkids, our children? So the fear of that, right, of what our children will be facing when we're gone, is on our hearts and minds. Who will take care of them? Who will point them to Jesus? Who will love them like we do? And God tells us he will. He will. He will take care of them as He always has been. He will call out to their hearts if they're running from Him. He is the good shepherd that won't stop when we're gone. He is the one who causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. All blessings, including life itself, come down from Him. Every good thing comes from Him. He is faithful. He is in control. Trust Him when He says that, and thank Him for it. Amen? Amen. And something else to notice as we look at this list. This here. None of these are dependent on our circumstances. Every Christian in the world can thank God 
today. All three of these reasons here. Every single one of us. And that's the truth given to us by God. May we strive to thank Him and live lives of thankfulness. Because our thankfulness is a direct result of a relationship with God. Amen? Amen. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, today is the day to receive God's goodness and His everlasting mercy and love, and you receive it by believing His truth, the only truth. And all you must do to be saved from the penalty of your sins is call out to Him, confess that you are a sinner, and place your faith and trust in Him for salvation. And if you'd like to do that, but you want someone to walk you through that, please come see me after this. All right, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for giving me the strength and I have the blessing of sharing your word here this morning. Lord, I ask that you would help us to apply these truths of thankfulness and praise to you to our lives. Lord, help us focus on you and all the blessings and the mercy and the love and the grace that you give us. And then turn that for a life of thankfulness and service to you, Lord. Lord, we thank you and praise you. Thank you for this church, Lord, and your willingness to let us come here today to share these truths with you. I ask that you bless everyone, get everyone home safe. In Jesus' name we pray.
answer for all our cares, for all our worries, for ourselves, for our families, for our futures, for our country, our community, Lord. We pray, Lord, that then we would respond accordingly. We trust you with all that is of value to us. For you alone are the keeper and the answer. We ask, Lord, that as we contemplate this, that we do not give you for a moment, but we 